talk to you about the bleeding edge technology that is uh, CSS and what's new there in our Canary browsers. There you go. Thank you, Selma. And just to be on the safe side, let me restart Canary because I'm pretty sure that during this demo it has accumulated memory leaks and whatnot. So that's just to be a little bit on the safe side. All right. Uh, we still have a couple more people coming in. Yes, plenty more chairs, don't worry. All right, so let's start. Hello, everyone. Uh, I've been introduced already, so uh, yes, I'm Martin. Uh, I work at Google in uh, developer relations. Um, some of us, some of you ha may have uh, met with me already. I, uh, I talk a lot about uh, our cloud technologies. I've run a training here about cloud. But today, we will be talking about HTML5, CSS, and uh, what's new there on the graphics frontier with uh, CSS. But before we go there, um, we, uh, I want to do a, a short reminder about how animations are handled in CSS uh, because we'll need it for later. So let's see how to do animations in CSS. The most basic way is to use a CSS property that is called transition. And yes, sorry, I will be uh, in the slides using the prefixed properties with the dash webkit. Uh, replace that with a dash moz or dash o um, according to uh, what your favorite browser is. So let's click here. What just happened? So on my click, I have a little bit of piece of JavaScript <coughs> that does uh, only one thing it changes the class associated to my picture. So this is the initial class. It has these properties. This is the end class. And so you see uh, here my picture is uh, on the left. Here it's on the right. And it has a 360 degrees transform on it. And what happened when I clicked is that the class changed and because I specified this transition one second property, the browser actually did the interpolation between those two states and created uh, a nice 60 frames per second animation. So that's about it for CSS animations. Uh, there is a, another syntax that is better suited for long running animations, like looping animations. It's uh, the WebKit animation property. Uh, it's just a little syntax change. Uh, so th this one is not triggered on an event. It's something you define and then you keep it running. And um, it works here. The first parameter is um, actually a, a name that you define using this slightly awkward add keyframes name syntax. And inside here, you provide a list of CSS properties. You, you can have as many of them as you wish, each one for one point of the animation, and then the browser will do the interpolation between all of those. So the keywords here are from or 0%, then whatever percentage you like to define intermediate points in your animation, and uh, 2 or 100%. Um, well, the, these uh, parameters here are maybe not so important for what we want to talk about here, um, but uh, infinite means that it's a looping, alternate means that it's looping this way and then back up th that way, uh, and so on. <coughs> so what can you animate? You can animate almost everything in CSS. You can animate a border width, for instance. I don't know what you can do with that, but it's possible. <laughs> but the most useful thing to animate are um, geometric transforms. 
and we have the transform property that accepts a wide range of geometric transforms, rotations, uh, zooms, skew, of course, uh, translate exists as well. And yes, uh, for the slide to be nice and, and understandable, of course, I have put my transforms into an animation, okay? And if I just apply scale 0 0.5, that displays a static image. I've put that into an animation so as to show you what, what it looks like. Okay, so that's pretty much all about it. There is a transition property, there is an animation property, and what you want to animate are geometric transforms. But this also works in 3D. Geometric transforms also have 3D equivalents in CSS, which means that in CSS you can do something funky like this. This is pure CSS, including the on hoover opening, which is also simply an on hoover CSS. <coughs> uh, it's not very different from what I, what I have shown before. The only difference is that our transform property actually has 3D <coughs> transformations. So you've shown the, uh, you have seen the rotate, that is a rotate X, rotate Y, rotate Z. Uh, translate also has rotate, uh, translate X, Y, Z uh, equivalents. And so with this, I can take uh, those little square tiles and create a cube out of them. So how did I do that? You see, I've used two tiles and used a translate Z, one to the front, one to the back. And then I put them inside a div, and on that div I apply a rotation, which of course I have placed into an animation to keep it running. And that's pretty much all there is to it. My two tiles pulled apart and rotated. And uh, uh, one thing to know about this as well is that by default it looks like this, okay? You need to specify a non-infinite perspective. Uh, you put it on some, some tag uh, that contains all of that so that objects that are far away look smaller and objects close by look uh, bigger, which is what you expect. But by default, uh, the browser has an infinite perspective setting, which infinite in, in this world means no perspective at all. Is it per div or per, per, per div? Per div. Yeah, you, you place it on the div. Quick reminder, I told you this was about geometric. Quick re reminder of how this perspective thing works. So this is how you do a 3D projection. The cube there is the, the 3D object I want to project on my screen. Uh, oh yes, this is not translated. <laughs> <laughs> Well, ekra means screen in English, and e means eye. You, you, I, I guess you got that. And so that's my eye. What I know here are the x, y, z coordinates of my point. And what I'm trying to compute is how is this point going to appear on the screen. So for that, I draw a straight line between the eye and my cube, and <coughs> where, where this line intersects the screen is where I want to display my point. As you see, I need an additional parameter to finish my computations here. This is what I'm looking for, and this is the parameter I need to add in. So that's the distance between my eye and the screen, and that's also called the focal distance. It's also called the WebKit perspective here distance. Uh, a bonus point for whoever tells me uh, how I calculate this, when I know the Y, the Z, and the F here, that's two triangles, one in the other. I use the theorem of? Who said Pythagoras? No. <laughs> <laughs> Almost, another Greek. Pallas, thank you. All right. So now that we have uh, those reminders in place, let's jump straight into CSS shaders. But before that, there is a thing called CSS filters. 
Uh, it's uh, a new addition to CSS. It's called, uh, it's the filter property. And it has a list of, uh, of built-in filters. So for instance, you can apply uh, a grayscale filter here. There is a sepia filter. Uh, I can blur this. <laughs> and the animation keeps running in the background. By the way, this is an SVG animation running. Uh, the drop shadow actually is, is, is done with a filter here. And so, you know, all kinds of possibilities. But those are predefined filters. Uh, one nice thing about this drop shadow, uh, you know there already is a drop shadow property in CSS, box shadow and text shadow. This doesn't do exactly the same thing. Box shadow will shadow really your box. But if you want the shadow to follow the contours, of either your SVG object or even of your bitmap, if it is a transparent bitmap, uh, you can only do it with this uh, CSS filter drop shadow. If I had an image here and I used box, sh box shadow, it would be the borders of the image that would be projecting the shadow, which is not what I want here. Here I want the shadow to, to follow closely the shape of my object, and actually here it even follows the, the animation. And, uh, well, of course, you can put all of them together. That's uh, kind of funny. <laughs> Let's stop it. But uh, there is one filter that is called custom, and that one allows you to define your own stuff. So that's the demo I've been running. This is my own stuff. Here I have, I have this page here is actually HTML. It's real HTML. I can, I can, I think I can select, no? It should work. Okay, normally I'm still able to do, uh, to select in the page. Uh, I don't know why it's not working here, but this is, uh, this is a real HTML page. These things here are done with borders. There is a table, a couple of bitmaps, there is text over there. It's normal HTML. And on, on that div, I am applying a custom filter that I have defined using shaders, and shaders are little programs that you send to the graphic card for uh, execution. So this is something really that you can program yourself to do exactly what you want. In this case, I wanted a wind effect that curls the page, that uh, adds some fluttering here, that adds the shading, you, you see the see-through effect here, and you have some shading, it's darker here, uh, plus, if I push the <coughs> if I push the effect a little bit, you see that in the fluttering here, there's a shading effect as well. So how do we do that? This is the syntax in CSS. You need to provide. So first, you see WebKit filter custom, okay, and in custom, you provide all your parameters. We need to provide two shaders. So this works in two steps. There is a vertex shader and there is a pixel shader. The vertex shader actually takes your div, partitions it into tiles, and then for each vertex in those tiles, it will call your vertex shader and ask you to transform the position of that vertex. So the vertex shader answers the question, where are my vert vertices? And then once you have, so this allows you to apply geometrical deformations to your, uh, your div, which is originally flat. And then once you have computed uh, where the, the vertices are, then in each triangle, for each pixel of the triangle, the system will call your uh, pixel shader. It's, it's a dot .fs because some call it also the fragment shader. And here, you have the option of modifying the color. So that is where you will be applying your blur effects, uh, your lighting effects, uh, your co color hue, uh, hue rotation effects, and all that. Um, don't worry about the syntax over there, the normal source over. Uh, those are blending and composition mode. 
they don't seem to be working right now, so the default is normal and source over, and that's the only thing that works. Um, 1990, that's the partitioning in tiles. You define how many tiles you want. Uh, this transform perspective rotate, that's what we have just seen. That is a CSS 3D transform, geometric transform. And you, you pass the <coughs> parameters here because it, uh, the browser will pass it to you in a variable in the vertex shader as a transformation matrix. So it doesn't, in this case, it doesn't apply the transformation. It gives you the transformation matrix that you have defined. And it's up to you to apply it or not, or modify it differently, and so on. And the most interesting part, from there on, you define your own parameters. So uh, here, since I, I want to curl my page, I'm actually rolling the page up onto a cylinder, okay, like this. So I need to provide an axis for the cylinder. That's a point and a direction and the radius. That's what I did here. But you can have your own parameters, as many as you like. And here we are, we are in CSS. So those parameters are actually open to transitions and animations. And that's why I did all this introduction on, on transitions and animations, because you can transition and animate between those parameters. And that's how I was able here to modify, let's say, the direction of the wind. Because I can modify using either JavaScript or using uh, CSS transi transitions and animations. I can modify the axis of my cylinder, the radius of my cylinder, uh, its p the position of the cylinder, and so on. All right. So let's dive into the code. You write those shaders using the JLSL language. It looks like C. It really is C. It just isn't C as you are used to it because it has a, a lot of specialized tricks to make your life easier for writing geometry transformations. And it's a fantastic language for writing geometry transformations. So first of all, it has ma matrices and <coughs> vectors. You define a vector as you expected with a constructor here. Uh, all the operators, uh, plus, minus, and so on, multiply, they work exactly as expected on matrices and vectors. You can multiply a matrix by a vector, provided they have the right dimensions, and so on. All that works. Um, something that is not C, however, is uh, the way you can access your vector components. So you actually have this notation, dot x, y, z, w. And with that, you can select any of the components of your vector. You can do vector dot x, that selects, selects just the y component. You can do vector dot x, 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 that will uh, select the x component three times and create a new uh, three dimensions vector that has this, uh, the, the same value three times. Uh, you can even put that into a VEC4 constructor and add something else to it. Actually, X, Y, Z, W are not the only shortcuts. R, G, B, A also exist. They do exactly the same thing, but if you are handling colors, color vectors, it's more natural to write R, G, B, A uh, than X, Y, uh, X, Y, Z, W. So it's just these, these little, you know, practicalities that make it a fun language to interact with geometry. And some more built-in geometry functions, a dot product, a cross product, uh, to, to, you can normalize a vector, which just means dividing the vector by its length. But still, this is, this is something you do all the time in geometry calculations. You normalize vectors all the time. Here, the function exists. Uh, for matrices, you can in inverse a matrix, you can transpose a matrix, and so on. Um, what else? And yes, these little functions, mix and clamp. Mix does a linear interpolation. Again, very easy to write by hand, but even easier if you just call a function. 
You pass it one vector, a second vector, source destination, and a parameter between 0 and 1. Depending on the parameter, it will combine those two uh, in a linear interpolation way. And clamp, that's for mostly used for colors. If you, if you need a color that is between 0 and 1, uh, well, you provide a value, min, max, and depending on what it is, it will clamp it to one end, the other end, or, or leave it in the middle. Just small practicalities, but it, they make your life much easier. Now, before we jump into the actual code, let's see uh, what is going on in this shape, step by step, because then I have simplified the code a little bit, uh, and I will be showing the code only <coughs> for little steps, so it's important to understand to see all the steps that are in this computation. So first, the mesh. That's done automatically. You don't, ha you don't have to do anything for that. Then I apply the curl. And so that you see a little bit more, I show it by the side. So you see, this is a cylinder, OK? And there are actually three parts here. There is a flat part. There is this semi-cylinder part. <coughs> and there is another flat part on, on top. So there are three parts, three cases in the, in the calculation. Then to make it a little bit more realistic, <laughs> I add uh, that uh, flutter. Uh, that's just a sine wave, OK? Uh, but the sine wave is added only to the top part here. And then in the pixel shader, and uh, the, the purple things uh, flickering here, those are canary bugs, you know? <laughs> um, and then I add the shading. So uh, there are actually three kinds of shading here. You see it's slightly darker in the middle of the, of the curve here. Uh, there is a fade to white effect here, which uh, simulates transparency. The, the back of the sheet is, is, is whiter. It's not as, trans as visible as this part. And then it's slightly less visible, but you can see it here. Uh, here, uh, I apply a lighting effect with the light source uh, so that when we have these, these deformations, you see small shadows. <coughs> and that's the end product. So uh, this is the pixel shader, uh, sorry, the vertex shader. So let's dive in. How does a vertex shader work? And sorry, I have to explain a bit of vocabulary. Uh, in uh, the GLSL shading language, you have uniforms, attributes, and varyings. So let's see what those are. As input, you have the first thing you have is uniforms. Those are basically constants for a frame, one frame. In the next frame, it can be different. But for one frame, uniforms are constant for all vertices. Then you have attributes. Attributes are constant in the frame, but they vary per vertice. So typically, that's the position of a vertice. The position of a vertice is an attribute. So this is per vertice. That's what you get as an input. This is your code. Okay, It's applied for each vertice in your mesh. And the goal of the vertex shader is to compute this built-in variable, GL position, which is the end position of your vertex. There are a couple more things you can compute. Everything you declare as a varying is something that, would, that will be passed to the pixel shader. And then you also realize that the vertex shader is called here, here, and here. The pixel shader is called on all the pixels in the middle. So how do these varyings come from here, here, and here to be there? They are interpolated automatically by the, the graphics engine. So this you use mostly for lighting effects and so on. So you will compute the lighting on those three, ed three vertices, and in the middle it will be interpolated. Now um, let's see what attributes, uniforms, and values we have in our code here. Uh, the uh, the first one is a is, is the position. So that's something the browser gives to you. You have to declare it, but you don't fill this variable. The browser gives it to you. 
that's the original 3D position of, it, of each vertex. The second one is the projection matrix. So that's something also the browser gives it to you. You don't have to worry about what is inside. You just have to know that the vertex position that you will have computed, you have to multiply it by the projection matrix because that is why the browser expects to find in the GL, uh, the GL position output variable. This transform, that's the transform that you have defined in CSS. So that's the 3D transform you have defined. It's up to you to apply it, okay? But it's a matrix, it's already all built there for you. And this is what I get from CSS. These are my custom parameters that I get from the CSS, CSS syntax here. This is my CSS style sheet, and these are the custom parameters that I have defined I get them in my sorry, I get them in my vertex shader code. Finally, outputs you have to declare them as varying. In my case, what I will be computing computing is the normal vector to the curved surface because I need that to compute my lighting effect. And of course, I need <coughs> to fill the GL position here. So. I promised geometry, so let's go with geometry. <coughs> this is the full code. It's not the full code. This is the code that computes the curved part here. So of course, there is another case for the flat part, which is easier. That means don't move the, the vertex anywhere. And there is another case for the flat part on the top uh, because uh, it's, it has this flutter effect, which I have added, but that, that's not here. Just the curved part. So. I brought a, a very useful <coughs> cylinder with me. How do you roll a, a sheet onto a cylinder? So, uh, the first question is when do you need to roll it up? You, you need to roll it up for, for, for vertices that are here. So the deciding factor is the axis here. Anything that is before the axis stays flat. Anything that is beyond the axis is rolled up. And what is the amount of roll? Well, it depends. It's the distance from the axis. Okay? If I am on the axis here, I, I, I don't move. Here, I move a little bit. And if I am all the way here, I'm rolled up, com rolled up completely. So that's why the first thing is to compute the distance to the axis. And uh, since I have n here, which is the vector that is normal to the axis, that's how I define my axis, the <coughs> point and a normal vector. And then my axis is something that goes through that point and is orthogonal to my vector. Uh, to to uh, compute the distance of my point to the axis, all I need to do is project a vector that goes from any point of the axis to my point. I project it on the normal vector, and that is a dot product. Okay, so that's why I have a dot product, position minus cylinder position, cylinder position, that's any point of my axis. Um, <coughs> and then, so once I have that, that distance, here I do an interpolation. So you might be surprised the, that the, the interpolation parameter is uh, the distance from the axis, as I have, as I, as I have explained. If I'm on the axis, I don't move, and if I'm far away from the axis, I move a lot. You might be surprised why there is no pi in this formula. Actually, there is a pi, because uh, what is the maximal distance for half a circle? That's half, uh, uh, half a perimeter, perimeter here, and half a perimeter is pi times r, okay? So pi times r divided by r, that's <coughs> pi. So there is a pi in my formula. And I interpolate here, so you, between two vectors, one is my normal vector, okay, like this, normal to the axis. The other one here is simply a downward pointing vector. So those two vectors. And as you see, if my distance is zero, that's zero, zero, and here basically minus one. So I'm here. If my distance is a quarter of a circle, my cosine is zero and this goes to maximum. So actually, 
I'm at the end of my normal vector. And if my distance is two quarters of a circle, I'm back up. The cosine is one, actually minus one. So this becomes one. This is zero again. And I'm here at the top point. Um, I multiply by the radius to uh, be able to modify the radius of the cylinder. And I add C, which is, which is actually the, the, the center. So that's almost it. I also need the normal vector to my modified surface, but that's very easy in a cylinder. In a cylinder, the normal vector is actually the radius. Okay? So that's just my point minus the center and divided by, a, by R to normalize it. So that's it. I have computed my semi-cylinder here. And to finish, so it's, it's in V, to finish, I need to compute this GL position, but this is really a no-brainer. This formula is the standard formula that you have to apply always. Uh, no thinking, uh, no modifications. You multiply it by the transform so that your, the, the transforms that you have defined in CSS are applied. You modify it by the projection matrix that the browser has given to you. You feed it to GL position and that's it. You're finished. And actually, here, the, you see here uh, the, 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 the rotation effect to make you see it <coughs> from this angle. That is a CSS transform. So typically, that's something that would come as, 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 as this matrix. And you have to do the multiplication, but that's all you have to do. All right, so we have computed our geometry. Now we need to compute the rest, so the lighting effects. Here comes the pixel shader. The big difference with the vertex shader is that it's called a lot more often. It's called for every single pixel in a triangle. So what do you have as the inputs? First of all, you have the variance. So anything that you have defined as a varying in the pixel shader and that you have passed to the vertex shader. Those varyings are interpolated. You calculated them on the vertices here, and the system interpolates them for you. So for what, what does this mean for us? We, have, we had one varying, which was the normal vector, the vector orthogonal to our surface. Um, so it means that on our surface here, let's, let's say we had uh, one triangle like this. We computed it in three different points. And the system interpolates this normal to give us a normal that is on the pixel somewhere in the middle of the triangle. Then you also get uniforms, the same uniforms as before. Those are constants for a frame. And the goal here is to compute well, mostly one thing, the CSS mix color. Actually, you can also compute a color matrix. So how does this work? Um, let's forget about the color matrix for a, for a moment. Uh, let's just think about the mix color here. <coughs> for some kind of security reasons, you never have access to the underlying pixel that you are transforming. Never. Um, probably that is because of uh, because people fear that using this you could you could do screen grabs and uh, and and take the, the pixels of the screen and, and then do whatever with them. So the only thing that you compute in the pixel shader is an, a, a, a color for your pixel that will be alpha blended on top of the background pixel. So that's. I mean, that's sufficient for, for what we do here. We add a bit of fade to black, a bit, a bit of fade to white, a bit of shade, shading effects. All that is, is just alpha blend. So that's what we will be using. However, if you want to do more, if you want, for example, to program this uh, hue rotation effect, where you need to replace red by, by blue and blue by red, for instance, you can't do this with a color that you blend on top of the background. 
for that you need something more powerful and if you have the possibility of computing the CSS color matrix which is a 4x4 four four matrix that applies any transform you want to the background pixel that you are computing here. Okay, so using that 4x4 four four, four matrix you can swap red and blue. Very easy. Okay. Um, the, the way it's, it is applied <coughs> is that the background pixel is first transformed using the, the color matrix and then it's blended uh, using alpha blending modes uh, using uh, with this CSS mix color. And the funny thing is, is that if in your code you don't touch any of those two uh, built-in variables, uh, the browser uses default values. So it uses an identity transformation here, and it uses a fully transparent black pixel here. Basically, that doesn't modify your color at all. The, the do-nothing pixel shader is just an empty name. That's easy. So let's see what our pixel shader looks like. I have to declare, uh, as you see, this is a, a bit funny, but you have to declare uh, uniforms and, uh, and, and varyings even if they are built in, so even if they are provided to you by the system. But uh, all the built-in variables, like CSS mix color, CSS color matrix, uh, the GL position, you don't have to declare them, whatever. <laughs> so, um, here, again, I'm showing only, only a little part of um, the pixel shader. As you have seen, it had, so here, it had three different, three different parts. There is a fade to white effect here. There is the little shading in the curve. And there is a not too visible shading effect here that depends on lighting. Actually, you see maybe that the curved part here is slightly darker. It's not very obvious in this shot. So that is a lighting effect, the, the easiest possible lighting effect. It's called Lambert shading. And what it says is that the illumination is maximal when the light is shining on your surface straight on. That's maximum. And it's minimum when the light is parallel to your surface. And in the middle, it's uh, in the middle. <laughs> so again, this is very easy to compute when you have the normal vector. You have the normal vector. This is the light vector. You want to uh, darken this pixel uh, depending on the angle here. Uh, and uh, you want it to be maximal when you're parallel and minimal when you are at 90 degrees. That's, again, a dot product. A dot product is actually pro proportional to the cosine uh, the cosine between those two vectors, and the cosine is indeed one when the when the, the angle is zero, and zero when the angle is ninety degrees. So that's what we do. We compute the dot product between the normal vector and the incident light. Um, I multiply it here by um, a factor that I have passed from CSS that allows me to control the intensity of this effect. And then, once I have it, I blend a black pixel onto my existing background color uh, using actually one minus shadow as the blending, as the, as the transparency. So if, let's see, if I have maximal light, it means that this will be one, one minus shadow is zero. That means my black pixel is completely transparent. It doesn't do anything. Maximal light just shows the background pixel as it is. If I have minimal light, this is 0. 1 minus 0 is 1. And here I have a fully opaque black pixel that I blend onto my existing color. So that's, that's black. It works as expected. OK. And that's it. We're done. There is nothing more to CSS shaders. And you should be surprised at this point. Uh, has anyone experimented with uh, uh, OpenGL shaders before? Okay, a couple of people. You remember the, um, the, the amount of blue code you have to write to actually declare a shader, have it to compile, uh, associate it to the right surface, and so on, and so on, and so on? Well, here, 
the only glue code you write is this. This couple of lines of CSS glue code and you're straight in GLSL. You can have fun with the geometry. You can have fun transforming your, your, your colors, uh, your, your vertices, and so on. It's so much easier uh, than, uh, than writing shaders in GLSL. That's what I really like about this technology. All right, so let's wrap it up. Um, just to broaden the perspective a little bit. Uh, actually, when you will find this presentation online. It has a lot more pieces uh, that cover all the possible animation techniques. So we have seen this one, CSS shaders, and we have seen uh, the CSS three <coughs> animations. Just so that you know, to complete this picture, uh, SVG has animation possibilities as well. And once uh, you, uh, you, you, you need to break out of the box of declarative animations, so those are, this is everything we have seen here. This is pretty much declarative animations. Uh, declarative animations can only do a predefined animation path. Okay? There is nothing you can do to interact with the animation path in the middle. So if, if you need more, you need to go to frame-by-frame -frame animations. Uh, there you have two programmatic methods. One is canvas, which you know well, and the second one is canvas 3D, also known as, as WebGL. And there's nothing else. Okay, so this is the whole spectrum of animation techniques you can use in, uh, in, uh, in HTML. Uh, and finally, I highly recommend Adobe's CSS Filter Lab. If you want to play with, uh, with those CSS filters, uh, it has plenty of already coded uh, CSS <laughs> shaders, which you can play with, experiment, and this runs in Chrome Canary. Have I told you about Chrome, the secure and fast browser? Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. I work for Google. And that's it. I'm uh, Martin Gorner. You can follow me on G+. Uh, this presentation, you will find it on animateyourhtml5.appspot.com. Just don't forget to switch to Canary when you come to the end. Uh, the, the end, CSS shaders, they don't work in normal browsers. And don't forget to switch to a normal browser for the whole beginning because Canary is so buggy that a lot of the animations don't work in Canary in the beginning of the, of the presentation. Thank you. And um, now, thanks. We have a couple of minutes for questions. Yes. Um, one second. Um, um, shaders and GLSL is quite an old technology, right? And so I wonder if there is a way, for example, to import uh, other shaders from somewhere else, or there, if there already exists some system to actually visually create shaders like Blender or something like can export in a shader language. So yes, uh, you can, the, the shaders that you have already have for OpenGL, mostly you can copy paste them, uh, but you will need, you will need to, uh, to, to do some modifications because not all of the built-in uh, variables that you have access to in, uh, in, uh, in OpenGL are available here. And uh, so it depends what you do in the shader. One example, something I wanted to do here, I wanted uh, to actually, in the shader, implement uh, a physical model. Uh, you know that, uh, that uh, uh, page that is fluttering with the wind? I wanted to actually compute the physical model of, of the deformation of the page uh, based on physics, you know, the speed of the wind, the friction, and, and, and the mesh model of, of the sheet. Um, I wasn't able to do that because for that I would, I would need from frame to frame to compute not only the position, but also the speed and the, accelera the acceleration of each vertex and pass that to the next frame. That, for example, I cannot do here because uh, my attributes are in only. I can't <coughs> compute attributes, take them out, and have them in the next frame. So that's one, one example of a limitation. In OpenGL, of course, I can do that. 
I can write all my attributes into a texture and reload it in the next frame. And, and uh, I have my, not only my positions, but I also have my, my uh, speed and acceleration, and I can do the full um, dynamic uh, physics computation on the graphics card. So maybe that's something that will be coming. So in a nutshell, you will have to do small alterations because the, the GLSL environment is somewhat limited, but it still is the GLSL language. It still conforms to uh, the, the model pixel shader or vertex shader. So a lot of your shaders are just copy paste and will maybe change a little bits and pieces. common problem with um, shaders is to debug them and um, I wanted to ask if there are any plans um, on the developer tools of Google to um, yeah, help the developers to debug them. So right now if you uh, do something that is a mistake the, uh, the outcome is that you have a black screen <laughs> and so that's all, you do, all the debugging you get. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> and yes, it's painful uh, whenever you do a typo black screen. Where did I type something wrong? Uh, no, it's not ideal, I know, but uh, that's how it is today. I know that uh, for, uh, for WebGL, uh, there is, um, if, you, if, you, if you search for it, WebGL shader debugging, uh, you will find a post that, that describes how to install a shader debugger that works with WebGL. So it's, that's something that debugs the graphic, graphics card directly um, and allows you to, uh, to see where your code is failing uh, on the graphics card. Um, but I'm not sure it's going to work here with CSS shaders because um, um, I don't know how much processing the browser is doing on the shaders before sending them to the, to the graphics card. So I'm not exactly sure how, how that would work. I haven't found a good way of debugging yet. Sorry. <laughs> uh, so uh, when can we expect this to be available in like, ordinary Chrome? It's a work in progress. Uh, please follow the progress of uh, the, the Blink team. Uh, we actually have, do you all know Francois Beaufort? You don't know Francois Beaufort? That is someone you want to, uh, uh, to, uh, to follow on G+. Yes, you do. Uh, Fran Francois is someone who, uh, let me see, you can. Uh, okay. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not connected. I, I want to show you his profile. He has something like several ten of tens of thousands of followers. And he works for Google now. Uh, but he started doing this before Google. What he does is that uh, he follows all the commits into the Chromium uh, code base and, um, and comments on them. So uh, he is very knowledgeable about everything that is going into the code. He, he follows that closely. And, um, and uh, if you want to, um, to know about what is going on in the code, but without actually reading all the code submits, you can follow Francois Beaufort on G+. Uh, OK. I really wanted to do this. OK. This guy. Okay, follow him, and he will tell you when this is landing in non-canary uh, Chrome build. Any other question? We have maybe uh, time for one more. No? Okay. Anything yes. wrong with the other pro vendor, browser vendor? Um, actually, uh, this uh, <coughs> should... Um, this is not something we're doing on our own, but um, I have to admit that I finished this presentation at 3 o'clock in the morning, so I haven't checked how it works in, in, um, in Firefox. 
Usually I do. All the rest of the presentation is uh, thoroughly checked into working file, <coughs> proxy, opera, and so on. Um, but here I don't have the information. I'll check. So. Yes. Oh. Um, <coughs> could you show a quick example of how it all ties together? So where do you put the shaders? Where? where um, uh, sure, as soon as I'm back here. So, um, it's this. Uh, you define uh, this, a div, with all the content you want in it, okay? And you apply this CSS property to that div. And so in this CSS property, which is WebKit filter custom, the first parameter wind.vs for a vertex shader is your vertex shader. The second parameter, wind, it's a file. Yes, it's a file. It's a resource like a JavaScript file. And the second parameter, wind.fs, is your pixel shader or, or fragment shader, they call it also, also. Okay? Don't worry about the mix and normal source over. Just copy paste that. Uh, the other modes don't seem to be working anyway. Those are the compositing and blending modes. Um, and uh, then you have a couple more parameters. So here to define the, the geometric transformation. Here to tell the system how many um, subdivisions you want in your mesh. And here all the parameters that you define yourself in CSS that you can control in CSS. You can control them even in JavaScript. Uh, and those are passed to your pixel and vertex shaders for you to do whatever you want. Sorry if this wasn't clear. Th thank you, and thank you for asking the question because I'm sure you, you're not the only one who missed uh, where the, the, the link was. All right. Thank, thank you very much, Martin. And thank as you. every speaker, you get the very limited and very awesome Ooh, Death nice. Berlin mug. Nice. Thank you so much. All right. Give the man a hand. So again, a very short break until uh, 12 o'clock, and then we will have another bleeding edge talk about making music in the browser using gamepads.